gonna go over everything on the Corvair. You guys have all been kind of screaming at me to post a video and I have not been being good about staying on top of it. So I wanted to go over a few of the big details. A lot of the questions that we've been getting at the car shows, a couple of, you know, like range, power, how it all comes together, how it all works together. Um, gonna be going over a lot of that stuff for you here today on this. First thing, well, the first two things that we're really gonna talk about are motor and battery. So the motor itself is from a company called NetGain. It's called a Hyper 9. I have the, what they would consider the low voltage motor. This is a 96 volt, there is a 144 volt that my friend Kevin uh, up, in Cal up in Northern California is building as well too on his car, on his Spider that he's converting. You should go look and follow him as well too. The motor itself is 173 foot pounds of torque. Uh, roughly, if you were to compare that in horsepower terms, it would probably be in the, uh, we like to call it the butt dyno, about 200 horsepower, if you were to compare it to that. Beyond that, when we get into the actual drivability of this car, because we've taken it to a lot of car shows and we've gotten a lot of questions about not only how it works, but the practicality of it, right? It's an EV, so there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about what it actually means to a convert one of these and b drive one frequently so we just crossed over about a thousand miles we've put on this car still working out some of the smaller bugs but all in all very drivable car very functional very practical for us with a roughly three mile per kilowatt hour that we get out of this out of this pack we got a the, the pack itself the battery is a uh, a set of five 5.3 tesla modules that are all wired together in series they come up with the voltage that we needed to run out to the motor i believe my fully charged is about 124 volts and discharged is i try to keep it i try to keep it above 100 volts but if need be i can drop it into the 90s if i'm in a crunch to be able to get somewhere if we're getting closer to the bottom of our pack uh, the pack is liquid cooled. It does have its own separate cooling system in the front end here that I'll show you guys as well too. So it does have its own separate cooling system as well as a, uh, a separate fan onto that because the temperature that the battery runs at is totally different than what the motor and charger in the back of the car run at. We try to keep the temperature on the battery pack around roughly 70, 75 degrees. That's nominal where they are the most efficient within the 18650 cell design from Tesla. So that's pretty critical for lithium ion cycle life. It's, real, it's a really great power density battery, but it's also very finicky for temperature. I'm sure you've heard of that, that EVs are not great in colder temperatures and things like that. Range, biggest question we get asked, biggest question, which is funny being at a car show. I, I gotta throw this in the video, because we're all parked next to all these super cool hot rods, and that's the, the family I grew up in, right? Like we have always been surrounded by small block, big block, the most obscure cars that are out there, we love them. But the one question nobody ever asks is the biggest question that we get asked is how far does it go on a charge? That big block in the Chevelle next to me, nobody cares if it only goes 70 miles because he just gets to smile the whole time doing it. We're doing it too, but we're just doing it a lot quieter. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're getting roughly 75 miles out of a full charge on this car. Uh, we very seldom go further than that. And it's been a very practical range for us because uh, it, it, it's, it gets us to the beach, we can go out there and charge for the day and then come back in the afternoon and uh, get it back into the garage with no issue whatsoever. The 75 miles of range may not seem practical immediately to the ear, but this car, especially being stuck in Los Angeles traffic, that 75 miles of range actually goes up the slower we're going. So unlike that of a internal combustion engine where its optimal speed is around, you know, say 55 miles an hour where it's getting the best fuel economy out of itself, a EV platform likes to be going much slower. All this, although this car can go well over 95 miles an hour, we don't drive it that fast. And when we're stuck in traffic doing 30 miles an hour, our range is substantially higher. So we're not, if we get stuck in traffic, we're not worried about, oh man, where's the next charger? Because slow traffic for us is optimal for this battery pack. If we're doing 70 miles an hour plus, it drinks the juice pretty heavily but we can still get that range that we talked about out of it. Charge time on this car. So we have a pretty small charger on this. We've got a 3.3 kilowatt charger on it, which does up to about 32 amps of charging. Uh, in miles per hour, it gets you 10 to 12 miles per hour of charging if you want to look at it that way. So the the downside of that, if you're thinking, of, if you're doing the math on your, in your head there, if we've got a totally discharged battery, that's seven and a half hours of charging. So it's never really, we've never ran it all the way empty like that though. And most 
if not every EV owner that's out there will tell you that they try to keep some type of buffer inside of that because, well, they don't want to be stranded mostly. But the other aspect of that is, is that it's better for the battery pack to be able to keep it above that minimum voltage threshold. So the, that, that 3.7 cell, that 3.7 volt 18650 cell, man, it, it can go from three volts to 4.2, but if you can leave it in the middle in its more nominal range of that 40 to 60% charge, the cycle life that you're gonna get out of that battery is so much greater than if you were to charge it all the way up to 4.2 and deplete it all the way back down to three volts. Cycle life is what destroys a battery. So we try to keep it in that sweet spot. Even when we store it, if we're done driving it, and we know we're not gonna drive it for the week or for the weekend or even a couple of weeks, I try to leave the battery to stay to charge somewhere around 40, 50%, just because it's one of the best ways to be able to store it. All right, gonna give you a quick walk around the car here and show you some of the details, if you will, that are around it that people have noticed as we go throughout. A um, Couple of things, front coils, so, we do we are lowered a little bit but that's mostly because of the 350 pounds that's in the front of the car uh the coils that are in here uh, i did take out the uh original coils that were in here and went to from clark's the mid-engine v8 so there's there's coil springs that you can get from clark's corvairs that are designed for a car that had a mid-engine v8 conversion where you take out the back seat and stick that in there uh, that seemed to be just enough to raise this to where we needed it. I did the little LED headlight conversion on it. That was actually, I did that when it was still a gas car. I really like those headlights on here. They look really, really, really good. Let's go ahead and pop the hood here for you. Take a quick look. So this is the battery box installed in the front up here. A couple of things we did initially. So had my wife Wrenchology Stormy over there convert over to a uh, dual cylinder system so that we got rid of the single single system that was originally on this car and upgraded to the dual cylinder uh, from Clark's Corvairs. Came in as a kit, pretty straightforward as a install, but my poor wife ended up having to replumb the entire hydraulic braking system on the car. But uh, got it all done. Right here, that is my service disconnect, the big orange plug. So that makes it for serviceability standpoint, if and when I ever go to sell this car, it'll make it easy for anybody that ever has to work on it because essentially all you're gonna do is pull that plug and the entire car, uh, at least for the high voltage is concerned, goes dead. Uh, the cooling system, we're mounted up here. I've got my reservoir uh, with cool, clear uh, lines that are going through here. They're 3 8 they can go bigger than that, but it seems to be more than sufficient. I've got a radiator mounted behind the battery pack. Uh, it's a little PC cooling kit with dual fans on it. Seems to do exactly what we need it to do. Uh, the big cylinder up top, that's a, that's a capacitor. It's a stereo capacitor, um, and I'll explain why I got that when we go to the back. I've got a smaller 12 volt battery on this, and that really just helps stabilize the rest of the voltage from the front to the back of the car. Uh, for running things like headlights with the stereo and everything like that. I, I was either going to do that or a bigger battery, and I think that that looks better. Uh, the bright halo that you're seeing, that is from my friend Kevin. He went through and had these made up, one for his car. For those of you that are Corvair guys, you'll know that this used to say turbocharged. This one's electrocharged from Electrocharged Garage. He made that for me, which I thought was really cool. Um, really glad to incorporate that into this. I had it wired into my charge light so that when it's charging, it's uh, that light's on and lets me know that the vehicle's charging. Other than that, I still have room for storage up here, and I got this awesome case from Ampervolt. So inside this, inside the case are the actual battery modules themselves. Um, they built this modular setup that's actually it went together really nicely. I was surprised how well that works. Um, and it also encases most of my Ziva BMS, or at least my satellite modules, I should say. The ones that actually pick up on the tap cells for the battery pack. Pretty straightforward. Um, and you can see my battery. I've got a temperature thermometer in my reservoir just to keep an eye on it. The charger over here. I'll disconnect it here for a second. You can see that it only takes premium electrons. <laughs> little novelty tag but I love it go through and plug back in here and should be charging here shortly interior was like this when I got the car nice red leather with pipe with white piping to go through 
Nice, uh, somebody had stuck a new carpet in it as well. Uh, instrument cluster, I went through and added a few things to it. For those of you that are paying attention, this is a automatic instrument cluster, and yes, it is a four speed on the floor as well. So I, that, that switch right there to the right of the ignition or the power button is what changes the direction of my motor control. Uh, radio is one of the retro sound upgraded ones so that we can have Bluetooth and everything that we want on here. We did install a Clark's uh, short throw shifter as well too to try to tighten up the once sloppy shift linkage that this car had when I got it, but it helped tighten it up quite a bit. Uh, in the rear is for stance. I, all we ended up doing was taking the rear springs out of it and cutting one full coil out of the back and it really, it's still raked a little bit. It's still lower in the front than it is in the rear, which it's not that much no noticeable, but it's it's enough where I like it, right, with the way that it is. One coil really seemed to be the trick to avoid any crazy camber issues like what a lot of these things have where they start to get tilted in. Even that's a little bit further than I have wanted it. Uh, but we're there now. Now to the main event, so to speak. This is what everybody wants to come look at. These fans up here, so I, I went through and totally got this enclosed in stainless. Um, had a company called JGM help me out where they we did a couple of cardboard cutout designs of this and went through and uh, had them manufacture this for us. It's a company that manufactures industrial sinks of all people and it really I don't it's not even doing it justice here with the light in here like this but man it's it's a pretty clean clean setup. Behind here so underneath on the back side here you're not really going to see anything uh, all of my major electronics, like my high voltage junction box. My high voltage junction box is right behind here, and that controls my battery management system as well as my main and auxiliary contactor so that I can distribute everything. It's kind of just a high voltage junction for where everything comes together to distribute out to the motor. It distributes out to the charger, and then it also distributes out to my DC to DC inverter, which is what takes the you know, 120 volts down to 12 or 14 volts to be able to charge my secondary battery. That's this battery back here. This is my 12 volt battery that I built out of recycled laptop batteries, other 18650 cells. Uh, essentially, it's, it's not a very impressive battery internally because it didn't need to be. It just has to be able to power everything up long enough for me to be able to turn on the ignition. Um, and it can, it can run the stereo and everything else that it needs to do. Cooling system, I'm sure some of you saw this over here in the corner. This cooling system does have its own separate radiator from the front, like I mentioned earlier. So this cooling system cools the SME controller. So this is this down here is actually a liquid chill plate, and you can see the coolant line goes back there and through and, and circulates through there to be able to keep that chilled. But it also, where the rest of my electronics are mounted, so my radiator, and my charger are both mounted above the transaxle where the where the HVAC case used to be. So above the rear differential and trans assembly is where my charger and all that stuff is located. So my charger is liquid cooled and so is my motor controller. But neither of them run at the same time so I put them on the same coolant loop because they run at roughly the same temperatures. Uh, and then there is a separate cooling fan on the radiator that's above on this side. The two fans up here this was kind of an afterthought. I kind of faux pas a little bit by enclosing all of this setup in here because I was hoping that it would stay cool enough on its own, but on a hot day, I was getting some thermal issues with the motor getting too warm. So what we did was install these two, I believe they're 10 inch fans that are pulling air from outside in. And there's a vent right back here. So that the air comes down and pushes itself out the back of the car down below right there. The coupling from the actual electric drive motor to the four-speed transaxle. This is probably one of the biggest questions I get. Uh, it is still mechanically connected. We'll go down underneath here a little bit. You won't be able to see too much. But there's the factory bell housing, and then there's the factory transaxle. And don't worry, that's not an orange cable. That's a red LED back because of the chargers on right now. You're seeing the LED reflect off of the axle. Uh, but there's the factory bell housing, and what Electric GT did for me was take my bell housing and 3D scan it, and we took some measurements off of the 
throw out bearing and the input shaft of the of the differential up, fr uh, up front there and we were able to build an adapter plate that adapts to the Hyper 9 drive unit. Um, really cool setup for us and it works exactly like we had expected it to. Still use my mechanical clutch, I adjusted it and it works exactly like it's supposed to even though I don't really need to shift this car. Relay box back here is my main harness that controls the inputs to the drive unit. So I've got like a, there's a wake up signal, they call it KSI, that wakes up the uh, the drive, the, the, the uh, SME controller to tell it to initialize. Then we have separate relay, relays for forward and reverse and things like that. And then it will also have a lockout and interlock relay so that it prevents the drive unit from being able to energize while the charger is plugged in. So right now with the car plugged in and charging, I cannot physically turn on that controller. There is a physically an interlock that prevents it from doing so. Wanted to thank everybody that's been following along with the build. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be lots more questions down below. Feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or here on YouTube if you'd like. Uh, we'll answer any and all questions as they come in. Uh, happy to direct or, or whatever we need to do to get some more of these things on the road. This thing's been kind of a blast to build and I'm happy to have it be part of our inventory. Mm -hmm.